I hope you're as excited about Easter as I am. It's on the way. And uh, next Sunday's Palm Sunday, and there ought to be a few other folks show up next week. You know, I always encourage people, you guys sometimes think that I make up stuff. And I don't make up stuff. When it comes to people and their attitude toward church, I don't make up anything. You talk to folks about the importance of welcoming people when they show up. Not looking at some guy and saying, well, what are you doing here? Man, aren't you, you miss the turn or something? Uh, uh, this is not Joe's Bar and Grill. How'd you get here? People have an attitude about coming to church that sometimes we fail to recognize is bothering them because they don't talk about it. I stepped into a home the other evening to make a call and there were three ladies that had come into that home to make a call and they had brought some kind of supper type stuff with them and they were sitting there with the lady of the house and I was there to visit her husband and I was introduced to these three and uh, the host lady said to them, you know, uh, his church is just right down the street. You ought, to, you ought to get over there sometime. I said, oh, we know where his church is. Uh, but I feel badly, said the one lady. Uh, I'd really like to go at Easter, but because I don't go all year long, I feel badly when I go on Easter. I said, well, why don't you come Palm Sunday? That's the Sunday before Easter. And then Easter, you can show up and act like you're one of the regular folks. <laughs> you see, we, we who show up regularly forget how those on the outside think. And they, they, they come in and they feel like it's written all over them. I don't attend here normally. <laughs> they think that they, they, they buzz off and on like a neon sign or something instead of finding a place. And that's why it's so important that you look at people near you, welcome them, encourage them, be a part of the ministry to them. That fellowship time is not just some phony deal to let the choir get down. It accomplishes those two purposes if you get involved. And you may be near somebody that doesn't want to talk. That happens. Somebody just came and wanted to sit here and didn't want anybody bugging them. And you have to find your way around that. And it's kind of fun. It's a great challenge. Going to church can be a very exciting thing or it can be the most drab thing in the world. And we try to work in making it more than a little exciting around here. I've been for a number of weeks into a series called The Grand Essentials. And since the third one of those grand essentials is something to hope for, that kind of happens normally on Easter Sunday. Next week is Palm Sunday, and I very well may do a, a sermon built around that. But today I want to finish up that series of the grand essentials by talking one more time about someone to love. Remember, Chalmers said this, the grand essentials of happiness are something to do Something to love. He didn't understand it meant someone to love. He lived about 300 years ago and they thought differently then. And something to hope for. And that series of messages on something to do and what our responsibilities are in the workplace to understand our vocation as believers is to walk with God and our occupation is what we do to earn our money in order to keep body and soul together. But our vocation is to be the controlling factor in our lives and in the way we function in the workplace. And as we've talked about someone to love, we face one of the great problems on this planet. We build relationships where we give our love to someone else and they give their love to us. And the problem is that one day those relationships are over as we know them because many times the barrier of death comes and we're separated. 
can't hear their voice, can't touch them, can't hear their laugh, can't be encouraged by their words, can't be needed by them anymore. Sometimes we build a relationship, it's destroyed through divorce. Sometimes we build a relationship that is destroyed through some total misunderstanding. Many people go to their grave carrying misunderstanding. I did a service yesterday where one of the great pains of doing that service was that this lady had allowed a root of bitterness to grow up in her life to where it became more than just a little bush. It was a tree. And she lived in bitterness for years. And it affected the people around her. Now those are real problems that we face on this planet. People fall into various categories. As a pastor, you meet all kinds of folks. You meet singles that come to you that are saying, if I could just find someone to love and to marry, life would be wonderful. You have married folks that come to you and say, if I could just get out of this thing, Boy, life would be wonderful. And most of those married folks who do get out of those things jump into the second one. And the divorce percentages on a second marriage are 70%. On a third marriage, they're about 87%. And yet people keep jumping in there. Some with that attitude, I'm going to do this thing till I get it right. You know, they just keep bailing in. But in so many areas of life, when we think about someone to love, we have a very difficult time understanding that the top priority of our lives needs to be our relationship with God through Jesus Christ as the most important emphasis of our life. He's always going to be around. He understands us warts and all and loves us. Knows everything about us and continues to love us. And when all the shouting is over, that's the one place we're going to be focused. And if you can focus in early on that, your time on this planet will have much more meaning than any other thing I could ever tell you about. It's a part of what God wants to give us while we're here. In Revelation chapter 5, I want to read that for you. This is a part of the revelation that John received. Interesting book. And when I read this chapter to you, don't get lost in, a, in a, some of the symbolism that's here. Don't run down any rabbit trails. Just stay with me on the main idea of what we want to do here. This is future. All right? Now, if you understand that this is still future, John looks and he said, I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne, a scroll with writing on the inside and on the back and sealed with seven seals. A mighty angel with a loud voice. Boy, I like that. God's big on loud voices. You know that? A mighty angel with a loud voice was shouting out this question. Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and to unroll it? But no one in all heaven or earth or from among the dead was permitted to open and read it. And then I, John, wept with disappointment because no one anywhere was worthy. No one could tell us what it said. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop crying for look. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. Those are two names for Jesus. He has conquered and proved himself worthy to open the scroll and to break its seven seals. And I looked and saw a lamb capitalized. That's another name for Jesus standing there before the 24 elders in front of the throne and the living beings. And on the lamb were wounds that once had caused his death. 
He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God sent out into every part of the world. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting upon the throne. And as he took the scroll, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each with a harp and golden vials filled with incense. And that incense was the prayers of God's people. Oh, listen, people. If we ever understood the place of prayer in the ministry that God has given us in this community, if we ever understood that, we would commit ourselves more and more to take time alone with God on our knees before him interceding on behalf of people, but also there to adore and praise and give our love and thanksgiving to God. The incense the prayers of God's people. And they were singing him a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slain, and your blood has bought people from every nation as gifts for God. And you have gathered them into a kingdom and made them priests of our God. They shall reign upon the earth. And then in my vision, I heard the singing of millions of angels surrounding the throne and the living beings and the elders. And they sang this, the lamb is worthy, and loudly they sang it. The lamb who was slain, he is worthy to receive the power and the riches and the wisdom and the strength and the honor and the glory and the blessing. And then I heard everyone in heaven and earth and from the dead beneath the earth and in the sea, exclaiming, the blessing and the honor and the glory and the power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Past, present, and future is covered in the theme of this great song. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open, for you were slain, and your blood has bought from every nation people as gifts for God, and you've gathered them into a kingdom and made them priests of our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. Past, present, future. That marvelous work that is going on of God bringing one at a time, one at a time, into his kingdom these that he brings and makes them priests. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, we talked about that earlier in this series, that we become priests of the Lord, a holy priesthood. The priesthood of the believer is one of the great doctrines of the New Testament that we have that privilege to go right into the presence of God because the way has been open. When Jesus died on that cross, he opened the way for us to step right in there. In this whole matter is telling one thing, it's telling the gospel story. Now, sometimes people quiz me and say, why is it you are just continuously pounding the pulpit and talking to us about the story of Jesus and his love and his death and his resurrection? Why? Because that's what we're going to be doing in eternity. That's what this song is all about. I want to be up to speed. I want to know going in what this story is, and I want you to know. And my responsibility is to declare that to you. But notice this. In worship, in the singing, in the hymns, in the scripture reading, in the prayers, in the preaching, in the giving of tithes and offerings, in celebrating communion and baptism, all of these proclaim the story of what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. If we are not in the business of interceding on behalf of others that they will come to know Jesus Christ, we're missing the great privilege of being in the family of God. As I drove this morning to the radio station thinking about friends of mine that need Christ and praying for them by name, 
telling people that. I went through a parking lot the other day and saw a car that I knew belonged to a friend of mine for whom I pray. And I stopped and got a business card out and wrote a note and stuck it right there by the door. So you'll have to see it when he unlocks his door. I prayed for you this morning. Later in the day, he called me. Got your note. That guy isn't sure what to do when he got your note and you tell him you're praying for him. Some of us seem to have a notion we're afraid to tell people we're praying for them. When there isn't a more wonderful thing we can do for them. Except to intercede on their behalf before the Lord. See, in the telling of this worship time in Revelation chapter 5, God is worshipped. The performers are the huge congregation in heaven. And the audience is God himself. In Christian worship, God is to be the audience, the congregation is to be the performers, and those of us that stand on the platform, whether it's Randy or Mitch or myself or Carrie or whoever, we're merely the prompters so that together we honor the Lord and worship him. <clears throat> but how do we think when we come in the door for the service? What was really on your mind as you came in today? See, we have a notion that the congregation is the audience. You come in here saying, wonder how the choir is going to do today. Wonder if old Randy will really have them going today. Or you come in thinking, well, I had a lot of interesting reaction to last week's sermons. A lot of people worried about my health. If I stand here and cry because my heart's broken, some people think I'm cracking up. No, I'm just a human being that I can only handle so much emotion and it spills. I can't stand here with my heart breaking over people and their hurts and just act like I'm rattling off the Gettysburg Address. And sometimes that makes folks get nervous out in the crowd. You probably need a vacation. Oh, I just had a vacation, thanks. Yeah, I was probably more rested last Sunday than I'd been for some weeks. And people come in today wondering, well, what's he going to do? I think myself, last Sunday was a dynamite Sunday. I think myself all week, what do I do for an encore? And you come in here wondering how I'm going to do. Because we kind of have a notion that the congregation is the audience and the pastors and the choir are the performers. One question, where does God fit in all this thing? What's his place? James chapter 1, let me just read you a couple of verses here. Concerning your responsibilities when you come to this place. We are humbly glad for the wonderful message we receive for it's able to save our souls as it takes hold of our hearts. This is James 1, 22. And remember, it is a message to obey, not just to listen to. So don't fool yourselves. For if a person just listens and does not obey, he is like a man looking at his face in a mirror. As soon as he walks away, he can't see himself anymore or remember what he looks like. But if anyone keeps looking steadily into God's law for free men, he will not only remember it, but he will do what it says, and God will greatly bless him in everything he does. See, the question is not, how do we prompters do? The question is, how do you do as an individual that comes here to worship God? And he is the audience. How does he rate you as one of those who is there to give honor to his name? See, I would encourage you to learn to come here and ask God to fill you up. Some of you have been beaten up this week. Some of you have been wiped out. Some of you just barely could drag yourself here today. You're tampered with the thought of maybe I ought not go, but you came. Come in and ask God to fill you up and then ask him to set you free to forget yourself and lose yourself in love 
and adoration and thanksgiving to God for his never-ending love. Someone to love and someone to love you, that's God himself through the person of Jesus Christ. He's never going to quit. <clears throat> and this kind of thing here <clears throat> that says to us, he's never going to quit. He alone who is worthy of honor and glory and praise and wisdom and riches, that's the one that loves us and is going to continue to love us and there's never going to be a break in that. And yet part of our problem is we don't know how to really see him. I asked you this last week to read Romans chapter 8 verses 31 to 39. That's your assignment again this week. Same as last week, read it every day, Romans 8, 31 to 39. And think about the God that loves you so much. Sometimes it takes a different approach for us to understand how poor is our worship. One of the magazines I subscribe to is Discipleship Journal, which is put out by the Navigators. And I noticed this week a little article on prayer. That's the small heading. The big heading is hailing the chief. And maybe this picture will help you understand what I talk about in learning how to come and give thanks to God for his love. He sat at his desk in the Oval Office waiting. He waited even though there was a stack of letters to sign, a cable to read, a press conference to prepare for, a briefing with the cabinet to attend, a tea for an ambassador in the Rose Garden. Looking up from his schedule, he smiled. Yes, there was a lot to do. But first, some people were coming, some very important people. At least, he thought they were very important. That was why he kept inviting them to come to the Oval Office and talk with him. He longed to hear what was in their hearts and minds, to talk about how they felt, what they needed, and how they could help him accomplish his goals. A voice on the intercom said, Mr. President, they're here, sir. Ah, he said, send the first one in, please. He leaned forward on the edge of his chair, waiting. The door opened and a housewife ushered herself into the room. Without acknowledging the president's smile or outstretched hand, she plopped down in a chair. Then she shut her eyes tight. She said in a nasal sing-song voice, Dear Mr. President, thank you for the world so sweet. Thank you for the food we eat. Thank you for the birds that sing. Thank you, sir, for everything. Goodbye. Before the president could say a word in response, the woman opened her eyes, got up, and walked out the door. He sighed. Why did it always seem to go like this? He pushed the intercom button and said, Next, please. The door opened and in came a stout man who wore a tuxedo. Again, the president's hand was ignored. O oh, thou chief executive who art in the White House, said the man, clasping his hands and looking at the ceiling. O oh, thou in whom so much doth constitutionally dwell, upon whose desk hath been placed a most effective blotter, incline thine ear toward thy most humble citizen, and grant that thy many entities may be manifoldly endowed upon the fruitful plain. Wincing, the president closed his eyes and rubbed his temples. And may thou thy dust hearkeneth, whatly didst shalt evermore in twain asunder. The man concluded in a loud monotone. Excuse me, said the president, but what? Goodbye, said the man, seeming not to hear, and walked out. The president sighed again. Next, please, he spoke to the intercom. This time when the door opened, there seemed to be no one there. Then the president looked down and saw a man crawling through the doorway on his hands and knees. Oh, Mr. 
great Mr. P President, blubbered the man, not looking up from the carpet. I am but a disgusting piece of filth in your presence. No, I am less than that. How dare I enter here? How dare I think that you would do anything but grind me into the floor? The president, offering hands, said, please get up. You don't have to do that. I want to talk with you. But the man went right on groveling. I deserve only to be squashed under the weight of your mighty desk, he whined. I could never have gotten an invitation to talk with you. It must have been a mistake. How can you ever forgive me for breaking in like this? Oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry, so sorry. And still on his hands and knees, he crawled out. And the man's groaning faded down the hall. The president shook his head and slowly pushed the intercom button. Next, he said, sounding tired. In moments, a young man entered. He was wearing headphones and bobbing up and down to the music of his pocket stereo. Hey, Prez, the young man said, ignoring the offered hand. What's happening? He looked out the window. Nice place you've got here. I'm uh, like so glad we could have this little chat, you know? You're not bad for an old dude, I guess. You don't bother me, I won't bother you, okay? Well, I gotta go hang in there. And he walked out. And the president drummed his fingers on his desk. Next, please, he said wearily. An elderly man marched in, staring at a piece of paper in his hand. He, too, ignored the president's greeting. Mr. President, he declared, keeping his eyes on his list, I want there to be a parking space waiting for me when I go downtown this afternoon. Not a parallel parking space, either. One I can drive right into. Not one with a parking meter. You can see to it that none of these meter maids gives me a ticket. Now this is important. The president cleared his throat politely. <clears throat> Speaking of important, he ventured, how do you feel about my program to feed the hungry? Would you like to have a part in? And another thing, the man continued, I lost my best golf club, a putter. Can't remember where I put it. Now you find it for me, will you? Got to have that club before Saturday. I know you can do it. Goodbye. With that, the old man got up and shuffled out the door. The president slumped in his chair. Next, he said. And there was a pause. At last, a young woman entered slowly. She looked like a sleepwalker, eyes nearly shut, jaw slack, her feet dragging. She yawned and slid into a chair. Dear Mr. President, she said with her head drooping. I know I should talk to you when I'm more awake, but I've got so many things to do. So sleepy. There was something I was going to say. What is it I was going to say? Uh, and she started to snore. And the president buzzed his secretary who stepped in the president asked, could you help this young lady out? The secretary said, certainly, Mr. President. She helped her to her feet. And the president gazed sadly out the window and said, how many do we have left? The secretary said, I'm sorry, sir, but as usual, most of the people you sent invitations to said they were too busy to talk. They had to watch TV or wax the car or do the dishes. Oh, said the president, dejected. Isn't there anyone out there? Well, there's one, sir, but you wouldn't want to talk with him. Well, why not? Because he's just a child, Mr. President. The chief executive shrugged. May as well show him in. Moments later, a little boy entered shyly. He looked around the room, his eyes wide. Are you really the president? The president smiled, I really am. And he offered his hand. And the little boy reached up and shook it. And then he sat down and folded his hands in his lap and waited. And the president watched, amazed as the boy sat politely for nearly a minute. He said, isn't there something you want to tell me or something you have to recite or to ask for or something to say? The little boy looked down for a moment thinking and then he looked up. 
He said, yes, I guess there is. Well, what is it? The president asked. And the boy said, thank you for inviting me. That's all. And when the president heard that, he couldn't seem to say anything for a while. All he could do was smile. But then they talked and talked and talked for the longest, most wonderful time. It's great. Someone said to me after the first service, boy, you didn't have to step all over me like that. Just read what someone wrote. You find yourself not having any comprehension of what it is to come into God's presence and say, I love you. One of the great things I love about Bob Masmanian, chairman of our deacon board, you get in a prayer meeting with him, and when he prays, he never, never finishes that prayer without saying, Father, I love you, and I'm grateful for all of the blessings and mercies that you pour out in my life. I think today of each believer in this crowd, once upon a time you caused a stir in heaven. When you made your commitment to Jesus Christ, whether it was 60, 70 years ago or last week, you caused a stir in heaven because the scriptures tell us there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. And again and again and again this week, there were those times of great rejoicing as people gave their hearts to Christ. That happened one day when you made your commitment to Christ. And yet it's so easy for us to fail to focus our attention on this God who loves us so much and will never stop. I want you to do something this morning. I seldom ask you to do anything like this. I want you to take a few minutes to kneel in prayer and focus your attention on you and on your God. And think about that day when you opened your heart to Jesus Christ. I want you to thank him for his love, which will never quit. Perhaps you're not born again as yet. And your prayer needs to be, God, I'm grateful for your mercy and your love. And I would like to make this 12th day of March my day of commitment to Christ as my Savior. Believer, it's so important that we take time to just stop and adore the one who loves us so much. And I want you to kneel, just kneel in front, this way on that bench in front. One day I'm gonna put kneelers in this church. But I want you to just kneel right there on the carpet and face this way. And those of you in the front row, I know that's difficult for you. But the rest of you, just kneel. We're just gonna pray while Tim plays and I'll close in prayer in a few minutes. But stay very, very tightly focused on your life and your gratitude for God or your need for God. Pour out your heart to God for yourself. Pour out your love for God. Let God do his work in your heart today. Father, it's such a beautiful sight to look across this congregation and see hundreds of people on their knees doing business individually with you. Some that are saying, Father, forgive me. I've never received the merciful gift of Jesus Christ to cover my sins. And today I want that to take place. May those people have the courage to fill out a card for us before they leave and put it in a mailbox around these walls. 
that we might be able to sit with them this week. I pray for believers who have struggled through this prayer time because they acknowledge how little time they spend giving thanks for your great and matchless love. Occupied with everything else, just like this little reading gave us, so that meaningful communication, heartfelt and open, is almost foreign to them. My prayer is that as we read Romans chapter 8, 31 to 39, we'll be overwhelmed this week with the magnitude of the love of God. We would pledge ourselves to walk and live each day in accordance with the will of God. So Father, we thank you for meeting us today by your Spirit. We thank you for the good things that will come out of this time together. We acknowledge again with gratitude that we are so grateful that we are the objects of your loving care. Bless us as we go. Accomplish in and through us everything that is in your plan. And we know we will be satisfied with that. Bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, people. So good to be with you today.